and primarily they're looking at, in our handbook, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. But I trust everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. Wonderful time. Family, friends, yeah. household, good food, good eating. Good Thanksgiving. And if we all take time out to pray with our family, pray our Thanksgiving. We all did that. That was the home of the son. And if we find anyone in our family that does not know Jesus Christ, to be witness to them, that was also a home, a home of the time. So we get these opportunities and should take advantage of it. Amen? Okay, as we settle, let's have opening prayer and we'll be started with our message, or our lesson for today. Eternal Father, we just thank you. Father, we have so much to be grateful. If nothing else, we can just say thank you to know that we know God, the God of creation, the light of this world. Father, we thank you for your involved spirit. We thank you for your son and his finishing work on the cross. And Lord, as a triune God, we thank you for just being God all by yourself. We know you have not taken your hand off your creation. You have not taken your hand or your eyes off your marvelous creation. And we thank you for that. We have so much to be grateful for. So we thank you in this time of Thanksgiving. And Lord, as we usher in the season, the season of Christmas. In Latin, we know that the word mas means more. <coughs> so Christmas means more Christ on. So as we say Merry Christmas, we, may we always think of what the true meaning of Christmas is. It is not so much for Santa Claus and Rudolph and the trees and the lights and all those traditions are wonderful in their own right. But the reason of the season is man, God with us. And we thank you for sending your son, and we thank you for the kindness of yourself, Christ, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your involved spirit, and we thank you for the day, Father, we ask that you have your work. It is in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So again, we're going to continue on our study in the college. Do you all realize that this is the eighth week that we've been together? And we have five more weeks to go, the end of December. And in that time, we're going to talk about, we're going to have another uh, game at the end. So all these handouts, they're not just information. What did we say last week? Information without action is just information. So we want to take a look at these things and go over them. And I think for the game at the end of the year, it's going to be a comprehensive set. It's not going to be just for what we get from them from the last uh, six weeks until the end, but from week one all the way to week 13. Amen? That'll make it a little more interesting. All right, again today we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And that's found in our handbook, uh, pages 149 to 151. So we're on section 4.3. And the list that they're using is 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 11. And those gifts are wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning, tongues, and interpretation. And as we get to the message, we're going to talk about each of those. But there are also other lists of gifts of the Spirit. You can find a list in Romans 12, 6, and 8, and also in Ephesians 4 and 11. But we're going to focus on 1 Corinthians 12, 4, and 11. And we speak of fruit of the Spirit. We're speaking of the character. And we'll talk about fruit of the Spirit next week. But we talk about the graces of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. We talk about Christian characteristics. Okay? There's a distinction. When we talk about the gift, Singular, the gift of the Spirit, we're talking about salvation. The gift of the Spirit is salvation. But when we speak of gifts of the Spirit, we're speaking of spiritual gifts which relates to service. And the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit is to edify the church. Amen? Amen. We're also going to talk about unity in the body when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to talk about diversity in the body. Now, when we talk about diversity. We're talking about folks can have the same gift and it's all for the purpose of edifying the church, but there are different diversities within even the same gift. For example, in the gift of teaching, Pastor Michael, excellent teacher. His brother, Pastor David, excellent teacher. But in different audiences, you need different the same gift, but you need folks to deliver the gift in different manners. 
For example, you cannot teach children the same way you teach adults. So someone can have the gift of teaching, but the gift is for the audience of children. And someone can have the gift of, of teaching for adults, but not the gift to teach theologians. See the difference? You can have the same gift, but diversities within the gift. Different audiences require different methods of teaching. Amen? We're going to talk, and I'm going to say this a lot in the, uh, in the next few weeks, WWWYTO. Walk in the Spirit, witness in the Spirit, worship in the Spirit, and to do so, you must yield to the Spirit, trust the Spirit, and obey the Spirit. So when you, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say even in the middle of our messages, because I'm going to drill this, WWW to YTO. And you know that's going to be on the, <laughs> you know that's going to be on the uh, questionnaire, the quiz at the end. So, WWW, walk in the spirit, witness in the spirit, and worship in the spirit. And to do so, you must yield to the spirit, trust the spirit, and obey the spirit. Amen? Now, I gave you the handouts prematurely, but we're not there yet. Okay? So, again, there are different lists from fruits of the Spirit, or, but we're going to get to only what I'll talk about is 1 Corinthians 12, 4, and 11. Let's talk about last week, just a quick review. We talked about the past roles of the Holy Spirit. We talked about, yes, ma'am? WWW, walk in the Spirit, witness in the Spirit, and worship in the Spirit. And that's on some of your previous handouts also. And YTO, yield to the Spirit, trust in the Spirit, obey the Spirit. Amen. You'll hear that time and time again. So it'll be, I can call you at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I'm going to say WWW, YTO, and you'll be here to spit it out. Okay? <laughs> so last week we talked about the past roles of the Holy Spirit. We talked about creation versus evolution or the Big Bang Theory, or Darwinism. And we talked about how it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it takes to believe in creation. Not only do they have holes in their theory, but if you take the beginning, the middle, and end of their theory of evolution or Darwinism or the Big Bang Theory, there's a black hole throughout. But creation, we have the, the very word of God that tells us how the world was formed. It was created by God, the self-existent one. Okay? Also, we talked about, well, let's see, we talked about inspiration of the Bible and biblical authors of the Bible. We talked about the importance of Paul and Saul. And we also talked about Gideon and Moses and their reluctance. I think Pastor Gaines talked about this morning about reluctance to serve. And we talked about how Gideon and Moses were reluctant in their service. And God said, Am I not the God of blank, 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 blank? So I go with you. We know that God has not taken his hands nor his eyes off his creation or his creatures. So if he sends you, you go in his name. You are commissioned. And when you are commissioned, you are sent. But when you are commanded, and we'll talk about this later, you are going to speak the very words of God. Now, when we get to talking about speaking the very words of God, there's limitations or those gifts have passed away. We talk about the gifts of the apostles and the prophets. There's no current day apostles or prophets. So we'll talk about what are the qualifications of apostles. We also talked about the present role of the Holy Spirit. And we compared sanctification and salvation in this sheet here. And you, have, you got the one we did together and then one we've completed. But here you have it again this week. So this sheet, we talked about it. And some questions came about as far as the crowns. We were talking about the carnal Christians. The point I was making was not so much the all crowns, but the crowns that are rewarded for service, not the crowns imputed to you, okay? It's the crowns that were rewarded for service. So now, let's move on. I'm gonna just do a quick converse, uh, commentary of what I missed last week because we had a lot of good, rich conversations. So I'm gonna go through this really quickly so we can move on with today's lesson. We have the spirit, but the spirit must have us. At conversion, you are indwelled with the Spirit, but you must YTO, yield, trust, and obey for the Spirit to have you. We do not have an obligation to the flesh, 
but we do have an obligation to the spirit. The flesh brings trouble, whereas the spirit brings life. Okay. Now, why do we have an obligation to the spirit? For one, the spirit convicted us to come unto salvation. The spirit revealed Christ to us, and the spirit impart eternal life. Once we are converted, it is the Holy Spirit that imparts eternal life. The Holy Spirit is, and this may sound a little contradictory, but here, the spirit of life, the spirit of death, the spirit of adoption. This is why we have a responsibility to the spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of life because he can empower us to obey Christ. He can also enable us to be more like Christ. Now, that's the spirit of life. Now, why do we say he is also the spirit of death? Because he can enable us to put to death or mortify the sinful deeds of the body as we yield to the members of our body to the spirit. He applies to us and in us the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He puts to death the things of the flesh and reproduces the things of the spirit. You can't have the spirit and the flesh. You cannot be predominantly dominated by both. They can be at conflict, but one will dominate the other. If you feed your body things of the flesh, you will live in the flesh. If you feed your body things of the spirit, you will live as one of the spirit. And that was a difference when we talked about the carnal Christian and the mature Christian last week. Okay, adoption. We said the spirit of adoption. Adoption means being placed as an adult son. An adult son. We are reborn, born again, and adopted into God's family. We can walk and be led of the spirit. We willingly yield to the spirit and the Spirit guides us by his word day by day. We have the liberty, the freedom of the Spirit. Okay, so now let me just do some quick more commentary based on some of the things we talked about in the past. I like a refresher of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit inspired the word and also illuminates. Pastor Gaines talked about that this morning. He illumines the word so that we can understand the word. The Holy Spirit has a teaching ministry. Since the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit cannot lie or be associated with lies. The Holy Spirit never leads us to anything that is contrary to the Word of God. Now, we doing something that's contrary to the Word of God, please don't say, I was led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God helps the Christian life to be joyful, thankful, and submission, submissive. Colossians 3.16 to be filled with the Spirit is the same as to be controlled by the Word. The Holy Spirit abides in the believer. The Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father in, resp in response to the prayer of the Son. Now, just as there, in, there are two parents in the physical birth, there are two parents in the spiritual birth. The Spirit of God, John 3 and 5, and the Word of God, James 1 and 18. You have the Spirit of God and the Word of God are the parents of spiritual birth. Okay, let us look at your first hand up, the first page. We're going to move into spiritual gifts now. Under construction, what we're looking at here is establishment of the church, the founding of the church, the construction of the church. So I'm going to use this handout now. An apostle, we said we were going to give a definition of an apostle. An apostle is one sent under commission. One of the qualifications to be an apostle was a personal experience of seeing the resurrected Christ. You have had to see the resurrected Christ to be an apostle. And those are the 12 plus Paul. Okay? Remember Paul on, his, on the Damascus Road? Okay, miracles. Apostles were given the ability to perform special signs and wonders to attest the message that they preach. Miracles were given to the apostles so that they can attest to what they were preaching and the people can see the miracles, they can test it, and they can say, Amen. Okay? Now, are apostles still on the scene today? It's one of those spiritual gifts that has passed away because it was for the founding of the church. So, be careful with this answer. Are there miracles today? 
There are no miracles of the apostles, no. There are no miracles of the apostles because there's no apostles, right? But does God still perform miracles? Okay, so there we go. Be careful in the question and the answer until we understand the question. So apostle miracles have passed off the scene. But the miracles of God, see, God is immutable. He does not change. His essence does not change. And he can still do whatever he wants. He is sovereign. If he wants to perform a miracle, he wants to perform a miracle of healing, he can do that. Now, we talked about the gifts of the apostles. Healing was a primary miracle of the apostles, the gift to heal. So, does the gift of healing through the apostles, through men, does that still, is that still on the scene? But you got the guy in the white suit and the white shoes and the white hat flying his plane all over the world. And you have thousands upon thousands of people showing up. My question is, if you have the gift of healing, go to the hospitals. Go to, go to one city and go to every hospital in that city and heal all those folks. Move to the next hospital in the county, heal all those folks. Go all throughout this nation, go to the next nation, and it'll keep that man busy throughout his life. If you have the gift of healing, go to the hospital and heal the sick. And then when you finish healing all the sick, go to the prisons. They are sick also. So if you have the gift, go use it. That's how we attest the gift, okay? But you have people who believe in him. Not in the spirit, not in God, but in the man, okay? Okay, let's look at, we just talked about apostles, number one. Then you see the little red two, New Testament prophets. Now again, the apostle and the New Testament prophets, their purpose was to lay the foundation of the church. And they did the signs and wonders and miracles. Prophets were spokesmen for God whose messages came immediately. He were immediately from God by the spirit. Not from man's head, but from the spirit. That is, they were commanded. First they were sent, they were commissioned by God, but when they spoke, they were commanded by God because he gave them the very words immediately. The ministry was to edify, encourage, and comfort the church. So any spiritual gift, that we talk about in 1 Corinthians, it is to edify the church. If it is a gift to edify the self, it is not a gift to be used in the church. Use it at home. If you believe you have a gift that is not edifying to the church, you need to keep that gift out of the church. And I don't know, you may have an idea what I'm talking about, but we'll get to that specifically later also. But gifts are to edify the body, amen? If it does not edify the body, if it puffs you up, if you're using it for material gains, it is not the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? So again, the prophets, their words came immediately from God, okay? Now, there's a difference. Okay, so now, let's talk about New Testament prophets then. Is that gift still on the scene? Does the word immediately come to the man's mind and he speak it? Hmm. No, 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 no. That gift also has passed because they laid the foundation. The foundation of the church has been laid and that church is built on the rock. Now some call it the rock of Peter or the rock of Gibraltar, but the rock of Jesus Christ. We know the church is built on the rock of ancient, the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, amen? Now you have some that believe something differently, but we know that the church is built upon Jesus Christ, okay? Now, let's, there's a distinction here between when we talk about New Testament prophets and teachers and pastors. Okay, let's look at that, the three, number three in yellow. Instructed converse in the doctrinal truths of the, of the Christian life. Let me reread that. They instructed converse in the doctrinal truths of the Christian life. Unlike the apostles, they did not get their message immediately by the Spirit, though, the Spirit helped them in their teachings, and that's James 3 and 1. Now, what do we mean by that? T the teachers of the doctrinal truths, remember, at this time when the church was first founded, they didn't, have, they didn't have the word as we have it today, Old Testament and New Testament. They had some Old Testament, and they had some scriptures of the Old Testament, but the doctrinal truths were being formed now for writing later on. So they had traditions. 
They had the traditions of, say, the apostles and, and the, and the, um, pa uh, the apostles and the uh, prophets as they preached the word. They had the tradition of what was they preaching to learn that. And how did they learn? How did the teachers today learn? When we say that we, the word is illuminated to us, the word is not uh, inspired, there is no Revelation 22 and 22. If someone say, turn to Revelation 22 and 22, you need to run away because there is no inspiration of the Bible. It is complete. The Bible is written. But there is illumination. Again, I'm going to use Pastor because I said to his message this morning. He talked about how he read Nehemiah over and over and over. Illumination is you can read this word. You can read it over and over and over. And then you read it one day and say, oh, oh that's what it means. You have been illuminated by the Holy Spirit. You have read it over and over, but the Spirit brings light to the Word. It teaches you. It teaches you the Word of God. So, we have teachers and pastors today. Otherwise, Pastor Gaines would just disappear. So, we still have the gift of teaching, but the gift is in preparation. He has to read the Word of God to prepare his sermon, to teach his sermon. The Spirit of God is not telling him what to say per se, orally, is teaching him or telling him what to say through the written word. Amen? So they are still on the scene. Teachers and pastors, the gift is still on the scene. And then you have the pastor Mercer. Number four, the evangelist. The evangelist majored on sharing the good news of salvation with the lost. They were the ones that went out to seek the lost souls. And do we still have that gift on the scene? Amen. Every one of us should be an evangelist. Every one of us, if, if it's not on the streets of Baltimore, it should be in our homes. It should be to our neighbors. It should be to someone that we know and maybe someone we don't know. Because remember, the other folks, they're out there doing it. Even though they're a cult and they have a false word, they're out there sharing that word. And we should be doing the same thing. Matter of fact, uh, Saturday, yesterday, yesterday was Saturday. Saturday morning, I went to the fish market and I got there a little too early. So I had to wait for the store to open. And a Korean guy, it was a Korean fish market on Rolling Road. I don't know if you all know what that is, that fish market out there. So I'm sitting in my car waiting for the store to open and knock, knock on my window. So I rolled my windshield down, and this guy couldn't even speak English. But he said something, 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 and he was trying to give me an awake. Now, I'll just tell you this. Never accept it. They don't care if you take it, toward it in the trash, or read it or not. Their goal is to get you to accept it because they are the number one print documents. They want to be able to say, we have more weight or whatever the watchtowers or whatever they want to call it. We have more of this in print than any other book or whatever. And we distribute it so we're successful. You can take it in front of them and tear it up and throw it away, but just don't receive it. Because once you take it and receive it, tear it up, they, they've met their goal. So now they want to go to the next one and pass them out. That's, that's their goal, just to pass them out. Because they think sometimes you might put it, put it down somewhere in your house, and then you might want to, you know, go to the toilet or whatever, and you want to read something, or someone else in your house come and pick it up, and they start to read it. So they're successful. Don't accept it. Don't even accept it. Okay? So, the last one. In the early church, and we talked about this, miracles was a part of the credentials of God's servants. They performed the miracles, the signs, and wonders. We're on the bottom pass or the first page. They did the miracles to attest to their messages. Now, did you have folks imitating or counterfeit miracles back in the early church? Absolutely. Anybody ever heard of Simon? Simon the sorcerer? If we have time, maybe we'll get to talk about him later. So, there were many gifts. And the gifts were for the formation or the foundation or the, or the founding of the beginning of the church. And a lot of those gifts have passed away, okay? They weren't needed because the church has been founded on the Rock of Ages, amen? Okay, let's move on to our next section now. Um, out, of, out of fact, let's do this. Let's take just maybe five minutes, no more. And let's talk about our spiritual gifts. Has everyone taken a spiritual gift survey? I mean, if you have taken it, raise your hand. Okay, let's share. Just what are your spiritual gifts? Just shout it out. What is 
Hearing? Caring, caring, okay. Teaching? Evangelism? Helping, teaching? Administration? Did I hear? Okay. Counseling? So what if service? So what if the body had all teachers? Would that work? What if we had all helpers, administrators? What if we had all of the same gift for the church? Would it work? Okay, very good. Let me ask you this. Are you using your spiritual gifts? Are you using your spiritual gifts? For those who don't know what their spiritual gifts is, maybe somehow, Pastor, we can make it available, the spiritual gift survey. So you need to learn what your spiritual gifts are. And when did you get that spiritual gift? Time of salvation. Let me ask you this. Are talents spiritual gifts? Are skills spiritual gifts? Can your talents and skills be used for the benefit of the church. Amen. You are given your spiritual gift at conversion, the stamp of approval from the Holy Spirit. But does that the, always the beginning of the development of your spiritual gift? No. No, why not? Good. Okay. Someone else? It is a process, but does it necessarily have to be at conversion that your spiritual gift is start the development of that spiritual gift by God, the Holy Spirit? By God. Say again? You don't have it before then, but can it be developed by God before then? The beginning of the development. The, the beginning of the development. Yes, absolutely. You know why? Because he knew you before the foundation of the earth. And if he sees things the past, the present, and future at the same time, and he knows that you are going to be a teacher, he doesn't have to wait for your conversion. You will be saved. He knows you're going to be saved, but he's going to, and it's not based on that pre-knowledge and all that, but he's going to go ahead and start developing that gift. You're not going to stand up and start uh, preaching or teaching the, the same day you get your spiritual gifts at conversion. There's a maturity process. You have to develop the gifts. If God gives you the gift of teaching, and you are given, like the brother David that was uh, converted this morning. He could be a pastor teacher. However, he can't be a pastor teacher next Sunday. He has to develop that gift. He has to spend some time in the word, amen? However, he could have a grandma that's been teaching him all his life. Now, I don't know his story, I'm just using him as an example. And has been teaching him that word. And he may be better equipped and you'll know that when you get the Bible study, when that, it's not so much the answers he gives, it's the questions he asks. It's the questions. Because see, your answers, you may have already got that figured out, but you want to get to the deeper things. So watch the questions. When new members come, listen to the questions they ask. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to stop preaching. <laughs> okay, uh, I think let's get to our, this page. See, again, I don't number the pages because I do a lot of them in beforehand, and then as we do the lessons, they change. So I don't want to put a number on it. So it looks like this one. It says the Holy Spirit. In the big blue, the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit. Now let's talk about that. So you say, well, what are spiritual gifts? What does it mean? Spiritual gifts, I'm reading from the text. I mean, right from the handout. And this is all coming from your handbook, as a matter of fact. Spiritual gifts are extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve. Let me say that again. Spiritual gifts are extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve. Enabling them to serve the church of Christ, the reception of which is due to the power of divine grace operating in, the souls, in their souls by the Holy Spirit. It's given by God. Well, I'm not just reading. Spiritual gifts are, are from God, the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts are supernatural. They are spiritual. We can't say, I want to be, I want my spiritual gift to be the gift of teaching. It's not up to us. 
It's a gift from God, and the sovereign God, the Holy Spirit, just, just determines what the gift will be. You can pray about it, you can do all that, but the Spirit of God in his sovereign right determines what your spiritual gift is. You can fight it, like you said. You can run from it, but it's your gift. And once you YTO, you will use your spiritual gift. Now, for those who came in a little late, somebody help them. YTO. Yield to the Spirit. Yield to the Spirit, trust the Spirit, and obey the Spirit. And you can't YTO or you can't WWW unless you YTO. What? WWW. Okay. Walk, witness, and worship. The way I remember it, the easiest way, is just take it after the W's, take the next letter and put them in alphabetical order. So you have the A, the I, and the O. Walk, witness, and worship. Okay? But to walk, witness, and worship in the Spirit, you must yield, trust, and obey. Amen? Okay. Spiritual gifts are supernatural. Spiritual gifts are for the purposes of the church. The purposes of God. They are not for your benefit. They are not to, for your income. They are not for your ego. It is for the benefit or to edify the church. Anything outside of edification of the church, it is not in the will of God. Now, I don't care how popular you get. I don't care how many people puff you up. If it's not for the edification of the church, it is not for, for the benefit of the church or from the Holy Spirit. Amen? Spiritual gifts are empowered by God. Again, last week we talked about Gideon and even Moses. When, they, when God had given them the command to go do, to go serve, they had reluctance. They have their personality. Well, my personality, Moses, I, I stutter or I can't speak before people. And God says, who's sending you, boy? Just go. Just go. Right? If God sends you, don't worry about your personality. Don't worry about what you lack. He will empower you. He will enable you. Okay? Spiritual gifts are gifts from God for the purposes of God as empowered by God. Every believer, now your text says every believer has one spiritual gift. I added in that at least because some believers have more than one spiritual gift. So every believer has at least one. I don't know what your gift is. You may not know what it is, but you do have a spiritual gift. So that's why we need to figure that out with the survey. And then we need to mature it. We need to grow it. And then we need to use it. And we need to serve it. But don't wait until it's perfected. It will never be perfected. Don't wait to say, well, my gift is not perfected yet, so I can't use it. I can't go teach theologians, so I can't teach. I can't teach theologians. They will yum me up. But I can teach children, right? Every one of us. There is someone that we can teach. Amen? Each spiritual, now I got a typo here. Each spiritual gift is given by the sovereign choice of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that. Each spiritual gift is important because of the giver, not the receiver. It is for God, not for you. And that's what his importance is. It's for God. Okay, the great diversity of spiritual gifts brings unity to the body of Christ. And we mentioned that earlier about you can't have all of one gift and also, even within the one gift for teachers, you have diversity. You have different teachers with different styles with a different delivery to teach, to teach different audiences. If you had a, a, a teacher and he can only teach the doctrinal truths at a level up here, and the congregation is here, and the children are here, he is missing most of the congregation. So you need other teachers that can break that word down and reach their audience. Amen? Okay. No one should compare his spiritual gift with the gift of another. No one should compare his spiritual gift with the gift of another. God has given you the ability of administration. You don't have to compare, well, I can't do this because such and such is so much better. Or I'm better than you. No, 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 no. God has given you a spiritual gift and a diverse spiritual gift, right? We understand diverse means even at different levels because the whole church needs to be edified. Not parts of the church, but the whole church needs to be edified. God's spiritual gift will never guide you contrary to the word of God. And there's a truth that everybody should adhere to. If you're outside of the word of God, the will of God, 
and you do something, you can't blame it on my spiritual gift or the Holy Spirit led me there. Absolutely undoctrinal, untrue. Okay, unity in the body. Now, we just mentioned this. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Lord. I'm reading the blue text. Four to one, this is 1 Corinthians 12, four to 11. Maybe not all of that, but for one, for to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of the spirits, to another divers kinds or divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And hopefully we'll get to talk about that. But basically it is the same spirit. The Holy Spirit gives all of the gifts and he does it in his sovereign right. But all these worketh that one and the, same, the self same spirit dividing to every man sever, severely as he will. Again, we all can have the same gift, but he divides and gives us how we are to use the gift, as far as the level of the gift. Okay? Yes? It's, real, it's mean, New Testament gifts. Yeah, it would be New Testaments. Look at, um, yeah. It would be New Testament gifts. Okay, I'll give it to you. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning, tongues, and interpretation. These are the New Testament gifts given for the foundation of the church. Okay? I can go forward? No, no. A lot of them have passed away. And we're going to get to that, I think, in your next sheet. A lot of those gifts have passed away. And remember, those were New Testament gifts given for the founding of the church. And a lot of those gifts were given to what? Apostles and prophets. Apostles and prophets are no longer on the scene. So any of the gifts that were assigned for them are go have passed away. And there were also some gifts given for the foundation of the church that still have passed away. Amen? Amen. And we're going to get to that. I hope. <laughs> okay, let me move... Okay, here, the yellow text, the yellow highlight and red text. Spiritual gifts unite believers in ministry to one body, the body of Christ. We are many members in one body ministering to each other. Again, the gifts of the Spirit are given for the edification of the church, the members of the body. It is given for sister to minister to sister to sister to brother to brother to sister, everybody in the church. And again, you may have some audiences that are here, some are here, and some are here. So we need people with those diverse gifts to be able to reach them. Amen? Okay. I think we're on to the next page now. We're going to get into the actual, the details of the gifts from 1 Corinthians. Let's talk about unity, diversity, conformity, and maturity. Unity without diversity would pr produce uniformity. Now, let's, let's break that down. Unity without diversity would produce uniformity. It's not always good to have, let's say, an elders board, where everyone has not only just the same gifts, but all introverts or all extroverts or all people that think exactly the same. I'll even say Democrats and Republicans. Let's just throw that in there. It's good to have people, if you have a corporation and a corporate church, you need people with different perspectives. We all have the godly perspective, but different walks of life with different opinions because it might be that one abstaining vote or the one that speaks out that changes the direction of the church. The 11 might, if you have 12 men and, and one man says, let's paint that wall pink. And er, all the other 11 say, yep, paint it pink. And then he said, well, let's paint the ceiling black. And the 11 say, paint it black. And you say, paint that one purple. And everybody say, paint it purple. So you got a pink, black, and purple church. Because everybody is uniform. You need diversity. You need some brother to say, now, come on, man. Come on. <laughs> now, I know you like the ravens with your purple and black. And it's the, what is that, breast cancer week? They have the pink on. But we don't need a black, purple, and pink church. <laughs> so you need that voice. 
not, and it doesn't have to be a voice of anger or just a, a voice that just, just a, a discerning, a, a voice of difference just to be different. But you need that voice in the church. Amen. Amen? And that voice, if, if directed by the Holy Spirit, will be a calming voice, will be able to express their opinion, and you can still agree to disagree, or you can agree, okay? But you need those diversity in the church, okay? Unity without diversity will produce uniformity. We don't want uniformity, okay? And uniformity, why? Because it leads to death. If everybody in the church thought exactly the same way and they were your leadership, the church could eventually die out. So you need someone like a young one to say like, oh, Pastor, maybe we need to do something a little different. Or maybe we need to do this. Or maybe we need to do that. And still he might say as a mature Christian, no. And you don't say, well, I'm going to pout and I'm going to get my way. You respect that because he's the mature Christian. But you need to hear that. And maybe the first time he hear it, he won't agree. But maybe the next time, or he said, you know, maybe we don't need to do exactly what you said, but something you said makes a lot of sense. And then let's come back together and let's talk about it. Amen? That's what we need. We don't need just conformity. Okay? Diversity in the body is an evidence of wisdom of God. Wisdom of God. The, the church is diverse. We all have different gifts because of the wisdom of God. He knows he, there's different things required for the church. So we have different gifts. Each member needs the other members. You can't be a leader, and we all are leaders, and be independent. You can't have silo churches. One church, one body, one God. And no member can afford to become independent. However, if diversity is not kept under control, okay, here we go, it could destroy the unity. And now you talk about if, if everything is just diverse, everybody can't agree, you can't finish a meeting because everybody's all over the place, then you are leading to destruction. The church cannot grow. The church cannot get the things done that they need to get done because you have chaos in your meetings. Okay? It could destroy the unity. Or it could be just that one person that you know, I sure hope that brother don't show up today. <laughs> We don't have any of those here. I know we don't. And you don't know any of those, and you never dealt with any of those. Okay. And then you will have anarchy. Maturity balances unity and diversity. Maturity. Mature leadership, mature believers, they balance the unity and the diversity. You need both. But maturity is what keeps it conform. Amen? It is the maturity that makes it work. Okay? The tension, 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 the tension in the body, tension in the body, not at manna, the tension in the body between individual members and the total organism to church can only be solved by maturity, okay? And I don't, I don't need to say much more about that. Maturity. Leaders are commanded, you can say commissioned, but commanded to be mature. That's why you're leaders. God's desire is there is no, I'm looking at the first box. God's desire is there is no division in the church. Diversity leads to disunity when members compete with one another. Again, do not desire the gift of your brother. If that's his gift, that's his gift. Your gift is your gift. Take your gift, use it for the glory of God. Amen? Diversity leads to unity when members care for one another. Diversity leads to unity. It's good to be diverse, but it leads to unity when we are led by the Spirit and we care for one another. When we YTO. YTO. When I say YTO, y'all just give it to me. Yield to the Spirit. Trust. Amen. We care for one another by functioning according to God's will and helping other members to function. We care for the church by helping one another. We care by helping them to use their spiritual gifts. We can help them use their spiritual gifts. And it can't be that we have a thousand preachers or teachers, but everyone is a teacher. You find that audience. You want to know how I started teaching when I first started teaching? As a Christian man, it is your ultimate responsibility to teach your children, to teach your children. 
but you can't teach what you don't know. So what I did was I started getting into Word. I started going to Bible study. I started learning the Word. I started growing in the Word. And then I said, y'all get here. Come on, sit down. And I started working with my girls. And then when I showed up at a church, I, don't, I didn't say I was a teacher. I didn't have, uh, like Marion Barry back in the day, he had a hat said mayor. He was the mayor, but he had everybody know he was the mayor, so he put mayor on his cap. I didn't have a hat that said teacher. But the pastor came to me and said, I think you would be a good teacher. I don't know where he got that from. But that's what happened. I started to teach the middle school. And then I started to teach other uh, groups in uh, Morgan. And also, I started to teach in my home, not only my children, but when my family saw what was going on, my sister-in-law started to come, my brother-in-law started to come, friends started to come, people in the community started to come, and we had a home-based Bible study. And not only did they come, but the cult came. Like-minded. Now you can say that if they come in here for our Bible study that we can't put them out. But in your home, you better put them out. Put them out quickly because they are there for chaos. They are there with a purpose. And they look for home-based Bible studies. And they look for a weak Bible study. If you don't have a strong person leading that Bible study, they will infest it and they will get in there and you can't say Trinity. You can't say things to them. You can't say the Holy Spirit. You just can't say certain things because then they get all puffed up and it becomes back and forth. So what you do, you don't have the back and forth the second and third and fourth time. The first time, you don't even wait for the back and forth. You say, get out. You in my house. <laughs> if you want to contribute to the mortgage, I'll tell you how much it costs. But I'm going to tell you, if you've got a home-based Bible study, you run it like you run your house. If somebody comes in there to hurt your family, you put them out. Amen? And they will come. They will find a way and they will come. Brother Larry. What is a cult? A cult is something that is, they may call themselves Christians, but their doctrine is not Christian. For example, you ask them now, and in the past you would say, well, Jesus is God. And they would say, absolutely not. There's no way. He's not God. And now you ask them, will you say Jesus is God? They say, yeah, Jesus became God. They still a cult. They still do not know Jesus. And the Jesus that they do know is not the Jesus of the Bible. So if it's not the doctrinal truth of what we believe as in the Bible, it's a cult. I don't care how close they get. If it's a cult, call it what it is. It's a cult. Okay. All right, let's go uh, finish up here. Even though my computer, I talk too much and my computer locked me. <laughs> okay. So here, in the red text, God gives to each congregation just the gifts it needs when they are needed. If this is God's church, he's going to protect his church. He's going to take care of his church. Just like he takes care of you, he will take care of his church. So he will give the congregation what they need when they need it. Okay? Maturity comes through love. The main evidence of maturity in the Christian life is a growing love. Three things. Love for God, first. Love for God's people, as well as a love for lost souls. A love for God, start there. A love for God's people, one another. Take care of one another. We take care of one another, and then it's more of us to take care of the lost souls. Start with God. The purpose of spiritual gifts, again, is the edification of the church. Now, let's talk about, I've got these gifts in buckets. The gift of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. Prophecy. Knowledge and tongues were not permanent gifts. Knowledge does not mean education. We're not talking about intellect. But the immediate parting of spiritual truth to the mind. Remember we said that the apostles or the prophets, they received the word from the Holy Spirit immediately as they spoke. That gift has gone away. So that's what they're referring to when they talk about knowledge here. Now there's also another knowledge, and we'll get to that, okay? These four gifts went together in their foundational ministry of the church. God would impart knowledge to the prophet. The crowd would be out there, and the prophet would come forward to preach or teach the word of God. 
God would impart knowledge. God would give him the words to say. And the prophet will speak the very words of God Amen. to found the church, the foundation of the church. Now, then God would impart knowledge to the prophet. The prophet would then give the message in a tongue. Now, what is a tongue? It is a language. Now, some texts may say an unknown language. What that unknown means is not an unknown language to the world. It is an unknown language to the person speaking. Sister Sheila, can I use you as an example? Sister Sheila speaks fluent Spanish, French, and English. Let's go back 2,000 plus years ago. And let's say she was a prophetess. Let's just say, let's forget male, female, and all that for right now. And she was going to speak the word of God. She would stand before them. Now, we know that she can speak English, Spanish, and French. And so you would expect her to speak one of those languages. And all of a sudden, she starts speaking Germany, a known language, but unknown to her. Okay? So that's what we're talking about, tongue. We're not talking about babbling. And, and unknown language and, and you know people just saying words whatever come to their spirit again if it's not of the spirit it is not of God if it's not of God you do not bring it to the church amen. you do not edify the church amen. Amen? amen okay I'm hoping I'm getting past that controversy of some that say I speak in a tongue speak in a tongue at home amen. let's leave it at that <laughs> let's just leave it at that let's leave it at that alright now if y'all want to beat me up later you can beat me up later but that's just, do it at home if you say you have a tongue. You got my back? All right. Well, speak to it at home. <laughs> I got bold now. <laughs> it got my back, see? When my brother's got my back, I get bold. <laughs> so, you saw I was a little timid at first. I said, well, if you speak in a tongue. But brother said, hey, we got your back. So, he that speaketh in a tongue of speaketh at home. All right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Again, these gifts will fail. They will be abolished. And this is the word of God. But God's love will endure forever. For God is love. That's 1 John 4 and 8. Now let's talk about speaking gifts. Okay? Again, this wisdom, knowledge. And there's a difference. The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. The ability to understand and apply God's truth to a definite situ situation. Again, now we're talking about knowledge and wisdom. And wisdom comes from God, okay? So now you have a wisdom or knowledge that comes from God, which is different from we talked about the knowledge in the first box, okay? The sign gifts, miracles and healing. Again, these were the gifts of the apostles. And these gifts were given to them to bring credence to their abilities. When they spoke the word and you see them doing these miracles, you said, okay, something must be right about this man. There was a the gift of discerning. But you also had the counterfeit miracles. Remember, we talk about Simon, the sorcerer. It was a counterfeit miracles. Okay, the sign gifts. In the early church, miracles were a part of the credentials of God's servants. There's a typo there again. Miracles and healings belonged in a special way to the infancy of the church. These miraculous gifts passed off the scene. Okay? So if someone tell you they got the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, especially the gift of healing, tell them to go to the hospitals. Go to the hospital and heal everybody there. Woo, you scared me now. <laughs> Earlier we said go to the hospital and the prisons. Brother Larry want to send them to the graveyard. <laughs> He's right though. Yeah, they raised the dead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they did it in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, it was Elijah or Elisha. That was one of the stories when I read first read it, when he laid on the guy seven times. He said, why did he have to lay on him? And what if somebody comes see you laying on that boy? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> the gift of faith. The gift of faith has to do with believing God for what he wants to, to accomplish in the church's ministry. That he will lead and provide. The gift of faith. Who did we talk about earlier about the gift of faith? The um, widow. Remember the widow's offering? You talk about faith. Now we could talk about giving what we give. But when you talk about giving all that you have to live on, that's the gift of faith. Giving your all to God, that's the gift of faith. What about Abraham? Remember Abraham when he offered Isaac up? That was the gift of faith because if you remember, he was about 3,000 years old, or 100 years old, a little over 100 at the time, and he had this boy, and he loved this boy. And God started to wonder, does he love this boy more than me? 
So God said, give up this boy. And he gave him up because he knew God would give him back. He didn't know the way. He didn't understand the way God was going to give him back. He thought he was going to resurrect him. But God said, I'll give him back to you. Just trust me. YTO. Discerning of the spirits. Important to the early church since Satan tried to counterfeit the work of God and the word of God. Today the spirit gives us the written word of God to give us discernment. There are no prophets. Thus false prophets, there's thus false prophets in the church today. However, beware of false teachers. False teachers can be very damaging. I'm sorry we have to stop here. It's 1030 and I am obedient <laughs> to my commission. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that has transpired here today. We hope that it is, will move your people and that this information will give them something to act upon. We pray that all that you have in store for each and one of us this day, that we listen to your spirit, we're guided by your spirit. And Father, we pray that as the man of God comes forward with the word, that it touches your people. And we also pray for David that received Christ this morning. Bless him, Lord. Let him grow in your grace. We ask these things and all things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And the redeemed says, amen. amen.